Ladies and gents, good afternoon. My name is Simon Brown. Uh, so we changed the topic. I'll come to that in a second. We're going to be talking, I need to turn that on. We're going to be talking markets and COVID-19, as it's officially known. And I'm going to start with the conclusion, and then I'll go through the presentation and come back to the conclusion. The reason I'm starting with the conclusion is so you can know what I'm getting to, and you can critique my thought process as we go along. Because let's be frank, this is a thought process, and you may well disagree with it, but this is what I think is going to play out over, over the next 12 months, thanks to COVID. So, so my big scary predictions for the next 12 months is major economic economies will head into recession in 2020, and I include the US in that equation. I think stock markets can fall another 10%. That probably happen while I'm speaking, but certainly another 25% lower from current levels, not from the highs of 10 days ago, from current levels. And that all results in Trump losing, which is moot. And that's not whether you like Trump or not. No American president wins an election when there's a medical or economic crisis happening. He's going to have both. Whether it's his fault or not is not how politics works. The good news is that this will all be over by the end of the year because COVID will be gone by then. Um, but this is going to have significant impact. And I'll talk through over the next 45 minutes as to what and why and how. And let's start with that map, which you will note there is now a dot in South Africa. In fact, there is a dot in Durban. Uh, we are now ground zero for COVID in Southern Africa, uh, COVID-19, as it is officially called. That is the John Hopkins. I've been monitoring this website now for five weeks, um, watching the numbers move and everything else, et cetera, and, 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 and the, 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 the data all come through. And the one thing that has constantly struck me the entire way is that the numbers don't add up. And this is a big part of my thesis here this evening. We've got, call it 97,000 confirmed cases. We've got 3,300 deaths. That gives us a mortality rate of 3.4%. It is deeply unlikely that COVID-19 has a mortality rate of 3.4%. Here's why. If, as a virus, your mortality rate goes too high, you kill your host body and you don't spread. Ebola has a mortality rate of 90%. That's why, truthfully, very few people get it because you die before you pass it on. Um, so I think the 3.4 is totally out, is, is totally wrong. And, and truthfully, we don't know mortality rates just yet, and it will settle, and we will know it in time. And most of these type of disasters, and we go to MERS from 2012, we go to SARS from 2003, mortality rates start high and end lower. I'm looking at about a, probably a 2% mortality rate. It might be as low as 1.7. The point being, for a 2% mortality rate, the only number on here that is absolutely certain is 3,303 dead people. Deaths are, it's why when you're looking at crime rates in, in countries, you look at murder rate because, you know, there's a body. I can fake stealing a car or not report it or something. I can't fake my death, although let's not go down that road. But you get the point. So that number is real. So once we start to extrapolate from that, we say, well, that's the real number. What, therefore, are the likely cases? And if we use 2% mortality, we get to 165,000 cases of COVID-19 on planet Earth right now that we know about. We don't know about all of them, and I'll come to why in a moment. Pause for a moment and think what the stock market does when they realize the tally is not 96,000, it's 165,000. Pause for a moment what that happens to people who are going out and about and attending events at the, at, at the Riverside Hotel on a random Thursday night in, 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 in March. This is not about the ultimate number of deaths that occur from COVID-19, and it's probably going to be about 10,000. I saw an alarmist article today that said 15 million. We're not even going to get within 100 miles of that. It's not about the number of deaths, which are all in themselves tragic. It is about the response to those deaths. And we get two responses, which is very different to previous crises. The first response is economic, and the second response is social. One is demand side, one is supply side. And what's going to happen is both of those are going to contract into themselves, and broadly our global economy is going to grind to a halt. As I said, the, the, the good news, if we can find good news in this, is that this time next year, COVID-19 will be a, a non-issue because we'll have a cure and an antibody. Yeah, we'll have all those things. They will be sorted. They're not going to happen in the next couple of weeks, but they'll happen by the end of the year. And what might happen, you note where that all is, is in the cold area there. Part of the thinking, and we need to still, but the sense is that viruses typically don't like hot climes. 
um, they like cold. So maybe as summer starts to move in to the north, that will pull back some numbers, etc. However, the implications are already happening. We're already seeing the grind. We're already seeing the problems coming through. The uh, cruise industry is reporting bookings for 2021 and 2022 are down 40%. Now, that's moot because they will fill those ships because by the time 2021 comes, we will the virus will be gone and they'll do specials and everything like that. But that's just an indication of, hang on a second. And let's think about it. You know, if, 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 so let's run those numbers. Let's go to, so the big number which I come to is potentially as many as half a million affected people globally. If we run that and we do population adjusted, which is a very rudimentary way of doing it, but we do population adjusted for South Africa, for KZN, and for Durban. We end up with about 300 COVID-19 patients in Durban, which means that we're running uh, at about six deaths. But we've got 300 patients, 300 sick, sick people in the city. Some people didn't come this evening. I know two people who didn't come this evening because we've got one sick person in the city. At 300? Yeah. Some of you are like, not a hope. Now, what does that do? You drove here, so it means you used some fuel. On the way, you know, you, you, you pop in, you, you stopped at the cafe and, and, and bought a cool drink. On the way home, you buy a pizza and a, and a glass of wine. That money does not get spent. That's what I mean by the demand side. Demand disappears because you self-quarantine. You're too scared to go out. i got a friend who's got tickets to Italy in two weeks' time, and he is white male 38. The sick man in Durban, white male 38, and uh, went to Italy. So Italy is going to lose that money, and, and we're going to see more of that. You know, tomorrow morning, you work in a factory, and your boss phones and says, well, we're closing down for two weeks, don't come. Lacquer, you got a holiday. But that business loses two weeks of sales. They're selling their widgets to a third party who can't get supply. They're being supplied by a third party who can't now has lost a customer. And that's what I mean by this is both demand and supply side and comes down. There's a lot of anomalies in the figures. You can see, I mean, Iran for ages has been wrong. So Iran had 107 deaths uh, and a mere 3,500 uh, cases, there's at least 5,000 cases in Iran. Uh, Italy, same, 107 deaths, there should be 5,000 cases in Italy. Last night, Italy closed every school, every university, every learning institution in the country, shut for two weeks. They've also said all sporting events for the next two weeks will be played in empty stadiums. That includes Six Nations Rugby, Premier or Serie A, and the European UEFA, whatever, I'm not a football, but all of those now have no people in the stadiums. What does that do to economic activity? And that's the grind that I'm talking about. This is not because millions of people are going to die of COVID-19. This is not Spanish flu of 1918 for a gabillion reasons. This is fear. And the fear is real. And, that, and you can see, so the, the, the people who are doing it right, South Korea. South Korea have been testing 10,000 people a day. 10,000 people a day. That's why their death rate's alarmingly low. America is struggling to test 100 people a day. So, here's the first sign that told us something was going terribly wrong. The picture on the left is a normal China looking at the pollution. There's, no, there's a gap between 20 and 10 because that's Chinese New Year, so the China shuts down anyway. Oddly enough, the pollution is not so much over Wuhan where the disease started, it's actually Beijing. Point is, the pollution never came back. It will in time, but the pollution hasn't yet, and this chart is now 10 days old, the pollution has not yet come back. And that tells you chronic lack of economic activity. And it's not just Beijing, it's all over. I mean, Hong Kong, same story. I mean, you know, Shanghai, the pollution hasn't come back. The economic activity is simply not returning to the world's second largest economy and largest manufacturing economy by a very long way. So human impact, coronavirus is essentially the common call. Uh, previous outbreaks was SARS in 2003, mortality rate 9.6. MERS in 2012, mortality rate 39%. The weird thing with MERS was it liked hot areas, which is weird, and that mortality rate, frankly, prevented it from spreading too far. As I said, Ebola runs typically at, at about between, between 50 and 90, but usually at the high numbers, which is why actually very few people catch it because the host bodies die and with it dies the disease. Um, Masks are of zero use. Unless you have a N.95 mask, 
you are wasting your time. If you have an N.95 mask, you've got to make sure you have the right size and you're wearing it correctly. And truthfully, unless you're sick, the point of the mask is to protect the other person, not to protect you. And there are no N.95 masks available on planet Earth right now. I saw some on my flight down, there were three people wearing masks. The one oak had a mask from Builder's Warehouse. Man, I've had those things. They don't even stop dust. <laughs> They're not going to stop COVID-19. Frankly, wash your hands. And do not use antibacterial soap because this is a virus. You need a soap with a rub. If you want to use some alcohol rub, you need about 70% alcohol rub. But to an expert that I have spoken to, it's really simple. Soap kills it. Just wash your hands every time you come into contact. Stop touching your face, which is alarmingly hard. And that's perhaps the best benefit of a mask because it stops you touching your face. But then just get a buff. You know those things that people, those buff things, just put that around your face, poke your eyes out, look weird. Um, mostly it's old men who are dying will come to, and that's because why? Because men touch shit and don't wash their hands. Um, and truthfully, it's those with uh, uh, respiratory issues as well. This is a resp respiratory disease, uh, a virus, and it is hitting that population hardest. And the vast majority of people who get COVID-19 will never know. It will be so mild. Point is, you can pass it on. You might not know you have it, but you are contagious for having it, and that's the problem with it. There is your death chart. There have been zero deaths of anyone under the age of 10, and that number was accurate as of Tuesday morning. Kids don't die from it. They, you know why? Because kids are just robust and they eat dirt and worms and stuff. COVID ain't got nothing on them. And truthfully, it starts to peak at 60, 70, and then the 80 is where it really, really happens. And again, men, which is why... Uh, Italy, which has the second oldest population in the world after Japan, has been so incredibly hard hit and will get hit even harder in time to come. It hasn't really got into Japan yet. When it does, Japan is going to get really hard hit because of the aged population. And that's just because, with respect, I mean, my, you know, my mother-in-law is 87 and she's old and frail. And if she gets a flu or cold, she's susceptible to death because of age. And now you bring something like this and you're a man, so you don't wash your hands, and well, yeah, I mean, it, it gets ugly very, very quickly. Um, it is at a 2% mortality rate, which is the assumption I'm making, 20 times more contagious and 20 times more deadly than the common cold. They are the same coronavirus, colds, they're all the same thing, but it is markedly more deadly. If you have a cold, your, transmi uh, your transmission rate as an adult is about 10%. As a kid, it's about 85, but as an adult, transmission rate on a cold is about 10%. In other words, you got a cold, you come into contact with 10 people, and one of them gets sick. Coronavirus, it's 300% with COVID-19. It is markedly more deadly, uh, and equally with, 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 with uh, 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 fatality. A lot of people are saying, oh, but so many Americans die of the flu every year. Yes, that is a totally correct fact. The point is, is that you know the, the flu mortality rate runs at about 0.1. Again, hitting aged, hitting frail, hitting those with pre-existing pre conditions, but it is 0.1 as opposed to two. And and a, a two percent mortality rate is one of you die. It is a staggeringly big number. You know, we think two percent. You know, ah, what's two percent? You know, it, for mortality rate, this is a staggeringly huge number. And the biggest track. We're going to end up 25 to 50,000 very sick needing medical attention. As a planet, we don't have enough ICU beds and respirators. I mean, we have 50,000, but where are they? Are they in the right place? Are they, et cetera, et cetera? I mean, we just don't have sufficient, which is why there's a lot of, of, of the chap who's in Durban. So his timeline was he came back from Italy on Sunday, through through our tambo went through King Shaka. I assume that's how you get back to Durban, right, from Italy. Um, came back home and felt uh, poorly on uh, Wednesday, Tuesday, sorry, Tuesday, uh, and went to his doctor, got swabs, and what he essentially did was he self-quarantined. But, I mean, he was in Durban between Monday, uh, Sunday and Tuesday and saw people and went places and went to his doctor. I mean, two things medical people are saying to me is don't go to pharmacies looking for masks because you don't need it, you won't find it. And you know what pharmacies have? Sick people. And if you're sick and you think you got COVID, don't go to your doctor, phone your doctor. And they will advise you accordingly. So the response so far, I was, I mean, I, I, 
Yeah, I, th this is partly my job is to try and see the big threats come into the market. And, and, and usually you miss them by 100 miles because they come from this field. And COVID-19 popped up still back then called coronavirus. And my thought was, well, this could be, but let's see how it plays. Not quite sure. And the market was fairly sanguine about it. Um, and then sort of two things happened. The one was there was a sudden spike in numbers out of China, 15,000 new cases. And that's because they changed their testing methodology. Instead of sending stuff off to the labs, that was only right half the time, they started doing CT scans of your lungs and they were getting responses back in 20 minutes. So suddenly their testing got better and therefore numbers went through the roof. And that spooked the market. And then the market worked out what had happened and the market was like, yeah, no worries, moved on from it. Um, and then what happened was Iran and Italy, where they've just handled it incredibly badly. And that gave us last week. The worst week in global markets since 2008. Now, if you, had, if you don't remember 2008, 2008 was the worst financial crisis since 1929. In other words, forever. I mean, for practical purposes, right? That's pretty much forever. So what did we have this week? We got Jerome Powell panic. There was a G7 telephone conference, uh, the Global 7, the big guys. They had a meeting a telephone meeting, and afterwards, Jerome Powell cut rates in America half a basis point for only the eighth time in the last 22 years that they did an out-of-meeting rate cut. Um, and he made two statements. The risk to the U.S. outlook has changed materially. The virus and measures taken to contain it will weigh on the economy for some time. And what did the market do? Initially, it went higher, but it ended that day almost 3% down on the S&P and the NASDAQ. And then yesterday went through the roof and now tonight, or last night, tanked. I mean, it's just the volatility. What does volatility tell you? 4% days up, 4% days down tell you fear and uncertainty. And that's what's driving all of this, is fear and uncertainty. Absolutely more than anything. Um, interestingly, if we go back to the other emergency rate cuts that they did, all of them had a negative stock market 12 months later, except for two. The one was the October 2008, and truthfully, that was the third in just over a year. Um, and by that point, the market, we bottomed in March of 2009. And the other one was Russia long-term capital management. Long-term capital managements were a bunch of, of, of boffins, like proper boffins. They won Nobel Prizes for math and stuff. Um, and they were collapsing. And Russia was, there was a concern that Russia would default and that contagion in, into Asia. And that, 12 months later, U.S. markets were green. But again, that was ultimately an emerging market crisis rather than a developed market. Point being, developed markets have a crisis, so will emerging markets. Emerging markets have a crisis, well, developed markets maybe, maybe not, depends what else they've got planned for this afternoon. Um, but when they do, we definitely, most definitely do. In all other instances, 12 months later, markets were red, were lower than when the emergency rate cut happened. The bigger issue is it's the supply side. I mean, there is some demand side, and I'll come into the mechanics of that in a moment. Rates work great with demand side. What do I mean by that? So in 2008, people weren't spending. Why? Well, they were scared. They were losing their house. Their bonds were going down. Their interest rates were going up, and therefore, they didn't spend money. So what do you do? You push interest rates down. You do quantitative easing, and basically, you force money into the economy, and that, in theory, gets people buying again. And in theory, it works. Unfortunately, this is also a supply side issue. In other words, so I had to buy a new laptop, my previous one, my battery was starting to expand so that the thing was rocking and, and eventually it was like, you know what, this, like, this thing's gonna explode on me. So I go to Apple to buy a new one and she's like, and I particularly, I want that one, like no negotiation, that one, that color, that everything. And she's like, oh, we got two in stock and I'm, so it's end of tax year, so I don't wanna buy it, I wanna buy it on Sunday, right, new tax year. Um, and she's like, we might sell it. And I'm like, you'll get more stock. And she's like, nope, we don't know when we're getting more stock. Why? Well, because those things are made in China. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. The other fund that Fed has is they've only got their, their rate, which is a range, is between one and one and a quarter. Currently, the U.S. Uh, FRAS market, which is the futures market on, on, on Fed rates, is pricing in four rate cuts this year from the Fed which takes the Fed to zero. He has something I never thought I would say in my entire life. If my grandfather was still alive, he would call me a liar. 
we're going to see negative U.S. rates in our lifetime. If not this crisis, in some crisis, there are negative U.S. rates. And intuitively, that is the craziest thing you've ever heard in your entire life, except for a few things. We have, at one point, more than half of prime debt, sovereign debt, was yielding negative. Scandinavia, Europe, Japan, etc., etc. Secondly, negative yielding assets are not a new concept. Gold is a negative yielding asset. It costs you money to store it. It doesn't pay dividends. Therefore, it's a negative yielding asset. Third point is, when people are unsure, or when they have too much money, what they really just want is certainty that they'll get the money back, even if they get back just a little bit. Rather lose 1% guaranteed than run the risk of losing 3, 4, 5, 10%. And I'm still, I'm trying to wrap my head around this whole negative interest rates, but I mean, there's a Danish bank which does a home loan, negative rate. Now ponder a moment, if that happened, if, you, if I could buy a house in Durban on negative rates, I would buy Durban. I mean, not your houses, but I'd buy all the others. Because negative rate, like, I mean, how can that, I mean, like, how can that not work? Except, I mean, probably some banker will think up something. Um, and, and this should, in theory, generate inflation, except nowhere on planet Earth do we, are we seeing inflation. So that isn't working either. It leaves the Fed, and not just the Fed, European Central Bank, uh, uh, Royal Bank of Australia, um, uh, uh, Bank, of, Bank of England. It leaves all of those central banks with very little wiggle room. Every other crisis that has happened in the history of crisis, well, no, in the last 100 years that we've had central banks, the bank has dropped the interest rate. Why? Because that floods money into the market and people spend that money. Not always, not all of it, but the theory is they'll buy shares, they'll buy, go for dinner, they'll buy wine, and that will help prop up a, a collapsing economy until you get to the point where there's no more space to cut. And you know, obviously, so in South Africa, we have loads of space. And are we going to see rate cut next week? Absolutely. The question is, how many will we see over the course of the year? Um, two is guaranteed. I think we might see four. Uh, particularly if this plays out, and what we need is the Reserve Bank and Minister Mbaweni to kind of play in sync with each other. And Mbaweni did his part in the budget of two weeks ago. Now we need the MPC to come to the party. So that's where I think markets are going to come back to around that zone. This is S and P because it's the, most, the, the sort of the two, two thousand two hundred, maybe four hundred, somewhere around there. Which sounds scary, but it's only twenty fourteen. You know, it, it's not very far. For us, a different game altogether because we're at the 2014 levels. Not quite. We're at the 2015 levels, but more or less. But that is, you know, entirely possible. At this point, we're a little over 10% down. That chart is from uh, yesterday. So it's fairly up to date, but doesn't include last night and doesn't include current trading right now. Last night, which I can't remember which way we went last night. I think, did we collapse again or up? I can't remember. I think by then today we were, yesterday we were up for the rafters and now today the U.S. is falling down its potholes again. Some countries responding better than others. China because of totalitarian command economy. So China shut down Wuhan as a city. Wuhan is 11 million people. That is bigger than London. That is bigger than New York. That is bigger than, I mean, bigger city. Let me go, let me go the other way. What are the cities bigger than it? Well, Tokyo and Beijing. Basically it. They shut down a city of 11 million people. There were, at one point in late February, 750 million Chinese under some, some form of travel restriction. That's half of China and 10% of planet Earth. Now, I mean, and that's what you can do as, an, as, as a command economy. Uh, South Korea has done spectacular 10,000 tests per day. The South Koreans are just an astounding economy. I mean, just an astounding country. I mean, they're absolutely an amazing, amazing country. Until you start going down the rabbit hole of K-pop, they list pop bands on their stock market. Yeah, I'm with all of you. That, that makes zero sense to me. But hey, uh, France, Germany done well. Australia done well. Why? Well, all of those have very, very robust free public health systems. Um, I, I got uh, a family in France and they moan about their health system, but it, it works. And, and that's more than anything important. The people who have done very poorly has been Italy and Iran. I've spoken about that already. When your deputy health minister spends four days running around telling everyone not to worry whilst sneezing, 
and then declares he's got COVID-19. I mean, so the Iranians think it's a scam that he hasn't got COVID-19, and now he's going to miraculously come back this weekend healed, I mean, who knows? I mean, that, that, that just shows a lack of trust in politicians. And that is fairly universal. doesn't matter race, religion, creed. Ain't no one trusting politicians anymore. Uh, Italy is just, they are so behind the curve on it. They're trying to catch up. They're trying to close the stable door, but that horse is long gone. The U.S. is just a mess. And I, I'll give you, th well, three examples. Two of them are two people, one who I know adjacently, a friend of a friend living in America, who had been to uh, 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 China in Wuhan, came back, got the symptoms, went and got a test, and got charged $3,000, and medical insurance is like, we're not paying for that. $3,000, that's 50 grand. Um, the other example is a woman in Washington State, which is where the eight deaths so far in America have all occurred. The woman in Washington State, who is 65 years old, uh, has been to Italy and come into contact with Chinese people whilst in Italy, and has asthma, and has all the symptoms of cold, therefore is someone who South Korea would have tested a week ago, and America's like, Mwah. we don't actually, Ugh. come back to us, please. This is in Washington, the state capital, where there are eight deaths. So these are the folks who've done incredibly poorly. As I said, Italy is at that point now, so all education institutions closed, all sporting events have zero people. Italy is the seventh biggest economy in the world. They're going to hit negative GDP for this quarter, and they're probably going to hit it for next. Because apart from this happening right now, and so you can't go watch your favorite football or rugby team this weekend, in three weeks' time, they say everything's cool, and the Italians are like, yeah, says who? Says the government, like, we don't think so. Like, please don't come and harass us with that. And that's that ground back in. So we have the seventh biggest economy in the world, guaranteed recession. <laughs> Never say guaranteed. High probability of recession in 2020 for the seventh biggest economy in the world right now. Um, the wait and see, Africa, South America. You would have seen up front there very few dots in Africa and South America. That is, in part, just simply because of infrastructure and ability. But it is also in part because we're very far from where it's been happening, China, sort of Europe and, and, and North America. Um, it's also because there's less economic activity, so less transfer of, you know, how many Durbanites go to Wuhan for business or Italy for holiday? I mean, not many, but if you're in, you know, Western Europe or North America, that's definitely on your radar. The warmer climate might be helping us as well. We think that's right, but we're not yet 100% certain. We'll get to that in more detail in time. But warmer climates certainly could be helping. And truthfully, maybe we just haven't yet found them, and maybe they're still coming. And, you know, patient one arrived today in Durban, but maybe there's another 300 uh, uh, Durbanites sort of queuing and still to come. Um, so the response that matters is medical community, and the medical community is largely on top of it. The problem is they are almost universally underfunded. World Health Organization, you know, just the medical community is, has been defunded over the years just repeatedly. It's an easy hop. Your exceptions are your countries with very, very strong free health care, Canada, uh, uh, France, Germany, the UK, those sort of economies where, where it's an important, seen as an important right. But you know, in governments that are struggling to make the ends meet, uh, healthcare is one of those places where you can kind of cut and nudge and, and, and you, know, you can't do it to education because think about the children. You can't do it to safety and security because that shows up too starkly in dead people. Um, you can't cut politician salaries so you boogie off and, and have some fun. Central banks, powerless, but don't tell them that. They think they can do lots. They can do some, but we'll come to more of that in a moment. So this is what I talk about demand versus supply. Demand drops off because people stay at home. They stay at home because they are worried about getting COVID-19. They are worried about getting COVID-19 because it is out there, it is highly contagious, and because people are dying from it at an alarming rate compared to other normal diseases or viruses that people are catching. So people simply stay at home. And that is only going to intensify more and more as the weeks go on, as the numbers carry on rising. Um, and, and we are seeing it. I mean, for example, you know, in this next slide, I'll come to it now. So, so we are seeing 
already that's starting to happen, and we're at 96,000 cases worldwide. When that number starts getting to 150, 200,000 cases, it's only going to be more and more people staying at home. And that grinds your economy because there's no economic activity. Your restaurant isn't selling pizzas and bottles of wine. Your stores aren't there making money. Nothing is happening. And then it also hits on the supply side because people stop going to work. They don't go to work because they're sick or because they're self-quarantined or because they're you know, medically quarantined. They don't go to work because they're scared. They don't go to work because their boss is scared. So let's go back to that scenario where there are 300 COVID-19 patients in Durban and you run a little factory somewhere in Durban and you employ, I don't know, 100, 500, 1,000 people in your factory. Do you let them come to work on Monday or do you phone them and say, don't bother? Don't come in. Short answer is not all. And, and what it takes is it doesn't need every factory to shut down, just some. And that's global supply chains. And we'll come back to that in a moment because that gets really, really uh, 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 dangerous in a moment. Supply side grinds to a halt as well. This really hurts and is very slow to restart. You know, the spending patterns are fine. One day, you know, somebody, a Minister of Health, Durban Mayor, stands up and says, Durban is free of COVID and we all go spend. And you know what? We've got money because we haven't been spending. That money doesn't disappear. So we go crazy and we start spending our money. So the demand side can pick up fairly quickly. The supply side is another whole different kettle of fish. And what happens is you want to spend, but you can't. So you want to buy a new iPhone, but there isn't an iPhone. So what do you do? Well, you wait. Maybe you can't wait because you need a phone, so you buy a Samsung or a Nokia or something like that. But, you know, an iPhone is something which you can wait three or four months for the new one. To, you're not going to be happy, but it's an iPhone. You can wait that little bit of time for it, no problem. So the spending comes, but there's a gap. And that gap is, is what hurts. Um, global conference has been cancelled left, right, and center. South by Southwest is happening in in, in Austin, Texas, America, and companies are pulling out. Uh, the first one was Mobile World Conference in Barcelona, first week of February, got cancelled. Uh, the impact to the city of Barcelona is estimated at half a billion euros spend from that conference. Didn't happen. If you're Microsoft, not going to, to Mobile World Conference, that's fine, you're Microsoft. But what happens if you're some, you know, some small little startup who's got this great little app and you poured all of your, your marketing budget into going to Mobile World Conference, and it didn't happen. And, I mean, what's the next conference? I don't know. I mean, they're going left, right, and center. The biggie is Olympics. Currently, the betting sites have got the Olympics 20% chance of not happening. They are due to start 24 July. I can promise you now the Olympic Committee wants more than anything for it to happen. I can also promise you what they don't want is the headline to say, Olympic athlete in Tokyo, COVID-19. Man, there's some, there's some headlines you don't want to see. Some businesses are going remote. You know, if you work for Twitter, that's fine. You can do it remote. But if you work, if you work on, a, on, a, on a banana plantation down the south coast, if you work in a factory making manufacturing goods, whatever they are, you can't work remote. So parts of, the, parts of, 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 of global economies, and that part obviously is fairly concentrated around the U.S., Silicon Valley and the like, but parts of it can. I mean, you know, I, when I worked at Standard Bank, um, you know, could, they have, could we have said to many of our staff, I mean, we could have frankly said to half of our staff, don't come back and we would never have noticed. Uh, and that's Jacob Marais chip. That's Jacob Marais. Someone once said to Jacob Marais, how many, at that point he's CEO of Standard Bank. Someone said to him, how many people work for Standard Bank? And he said, about half of them. Yeah. <laughs> And I was working at Center Bank at that point, and I'm like, yeah, you, 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 don't work, go home. A lot of staff can go home and work from home. Productivity, well, don't worry about that, but it can happen. A lot can't. You know, call centers, I mean, there's a lot who can't, money counters and stuff. There's some flexibility there. Um, but it's that production which grinds to a halt, and then now your growth is getting hit. Demand, we're not spending. Supply, we've got nothing to spend it on. Money doesn't disappear. You know, I've got a friend who's got tickets to Italy. I think they're non-refundable in two weeks' time. 
I mean, is he going? I mean, I don't know. Yesterday he was going. Today, I don't know. Um, you know, he loses that money, but it's not the end. You know, someone in Italy has got his money. That money doesn't vanish. If you self-quarantine for two weeks and don't spend a cent for two weeks, you've still got the money. But it vanishes from a window of opportunity. You know, typically your money is spread out over 12 months. Now we're going to have a gap in the middle where it's not being spent. Uh, so it comes back later. comes back slowly. But for now, it is disappearing. And, and, you know, as as an upside, and it's a weird upside, you know, maybe people will invest and save it. I mean, probably not. I mean, you know, like there's bubbles and wine and stuff to drink, but we'll we'll see how that goes. So market economic impact, iPhone, supply chains. Now, this is iPhone 6, which is horribly old, but I couldn't find as pretty a graphic for the iPhone 11. However, the iPhone 11 is slightly more complex than the 6. So those are all the different countries where components come from. There are 16 components made in America that are shipped over. Britain, Netherlands, uh, Japan, one each, Germany, uh, two, South Korea, three, six and six in China and Taiwan. And then it is made in China. 34 components. If 33 of them arrive, you don't have an iPhone. You need all of them to arrive on the same day at the right time. Understand that the way Foxconn runs, when they are running at what they call optimal efficiency, a component comes into that factory and exits four hours later as an iPhone or whatever they're making. Four hours. That is their target. And they can get that number, and they have at times components are exiting the factory within two and a half to three hours of arriving. That is what the new global supply chains are. This is what Tim Cook, who's now the CEO of Apple, this is what he made. He made a global supply chain at Apple that is the envy of everyone, and everyone's now copying him. All you need, so here's for the problem. The provinces adjacent to Wuhan in China have been allowed to go back to normal activity. But the one city which has one of those components for making iPhones, the city has decreed that you can reopen your factory But staff need to wear face masks. Problem. There are none. So the factory can't open. So Foxconn can't get their components. Which means there are factories in all of these countries sitting idle, not making money. There are suppliers into these factories sitting idle, not making money. The phones aren't coming out the other end and being sold by iStores the world over and making Apple money. The supply chain has ground to a halt. Will it restart? Yes. But it's not the old days where you walked into a factory, switched the light on, and you were back in business. These things restart slowly. How slowly? I, I I can't get that information. Partly because we don't know. I mean, we just don't know. You know, but if, if, if all the parts, I mean, in probably a couple of days, maybe a week, if everything's running smooth. But it's not all running smooth at this point. No, it absolutely is not. So restarting is hard. There's going to be shortages of big ticket items. You know, the, the, I mean, South Korea makes the bun- bunches of the motor cars that we drive, and there are going to be shortages because those factories are not producing right now. They're not getting their inputs, and it's simply not happening. White appliances, electronics, but also smaller things, garments. Where are most of our garments that we wear made? Bangladesh and China. Well, like, you know, if you've got a fancy event in a couple of months, maybe buy the garment now because there's going to be shortages going through. There will be shortages of food. We've seen the toilet paper already. (coughs) The food is quite interesting. I mean, and why the shortages of food? Well, again, because the staff on the farms are sent home because of concerns, but also because the farmers can't get seed, they can't get fertilizer, they can't get pestilence spray. And then what happens is the banana farm that shut down restarts but those bananas that are on the vine have been there for two weeks too long, not looked over. They're now overripe. They're chopped off, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is not food in the sense of if you don't stock up now, you won't eat. But it's going to put strain on supply chains. It absolutely is. Um, commodities, I mean, the idea is that you buy gold, except that there's two problems with gold, is that every time the crisis happens, the price goes down. Why? Because either you need cash. You got margin calls. Well, you know what? You need to pay your rent. And you know what you can't pay your rent with? A gold bar. That person wants randellas or dollars or yen or whatever. They, you don't walk up there, gold bar, I'll shave you off three grams. I've been saying this for decades. When stuff gets real, water and pumpkin seeds, man, don't come to me with your gold bar. 
Like, I can't eat that shit. It's heavy. I'm not interested in it. Like, bring me proper, tangible, real stuff. Everything goes down. Demand disappears. So OPEC has cut oil, price, oil production today. Uh, one and a half million barrels to try and prop the oil price up. OPEC is a has-been. In the 70s, they were powerful. They simply don't control enough of the supply. And the problem is people cheat. Why? Because Russia, a member of OPEC, says, yes, yes, we'll cut. But Russia also, frankly, needs revenue. So they don't cut. They cheat. Why? Because, yes, they're making less money per barrel because price is lower, but rather money than no money type of scenario. Um, your PGMs, oddly enough, your P the, the platinum groups, apart from platinum, but rhodium and palladium have held up thus far. But what is their big demand? Motor vehicles. Uh, you know, there they are. They're on the list. Um, Bitcoin, I have no idea. Bitcoin has been going down at the same time. Bitcoin is many things. It turns out a safe haven. It is not, color me, not surprised. Um, is there a quick way out? Short answer, no. I mean, maybe if tomorrow someone stands up and says we have a cure and a this and a that and everything else, a, 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 a antibiotic and all of those and et cetera, I mean, maybe that's the quick way out. Cutting rates helps, but it's not a solution to it. This isn't something that we can magic away and, and, and wish it hadn't it didn't happen. It is happening and it, it is real. Goldman Sachs says minimal US earnings for Q1. That statement is now two weeks old. Minimal, and they said maybe zero. Uh, I think, I mean, we're getting the warnings. Tim Cook and Apple warned three and a half weeks ago that supply chain dis disruptions were going to hurt their sales of in Q1. Now, understand how it also works. So, you know, Q1 is not a big quarter for Apple. Their, their big quarter is sort of September and the last quarter with new product and stuff. But they've got rumored to have a new small, cheap iPhone coming out in a couple of weeks. Are they going to push that back? James Bond movie's been pushed back to November. Um, but also, if you're, if you're Apple and you've got a product you're launching for Christmas, you're testing it now. You're building it now which means your Christmas product either might go to market sort of half-baked, or maybe it doesn't go to market. Maybe well, it goes to market in February. So then my big scary predictions. I do a year-end presentation every year in Johannesburg, which I talk position, positioning your portfolio for the next year. I mean, I did it this last year. I was cautiously optimistic, not so much in the US, because it's been running far too hard, far too fast. In truth, I've said that for two or three years in a row, and I've been wrong for all of those two or three years. But I did put that big picture of pairs up because I said, you know what, we're at that point where things can go very pear-shaped. And understand that when a crisis happens, the point of where the global economy matters. So if we had a crisis in, in, in 2010, it would have been disastrous because we had just come out of the previous. If we had had a crisis in 2015, global markets would have shrugged it off because, you know, valuations were middling, money was flowing. At this point, we're having a crisis when valuations, certainly in America, are exceedingly stretched. You know, you bought Tesla at 100 bucks and now it's $1,000 and you're like, you know what, I'm taking my money and I'm running. You didn't buy Tesla at 100 and now it's 104. And you're sitting on giant size profit and you're like, I want some of that profit. And, and that's very much unique to America. But I did say, you know, like there's stuff, we're at this point where things can go pear-shaped. You know, black swans and like, and I don't know what they'll be, but they're going to come at us. And this is my pears, I do very much suspect. So back to where I started. Major economies head into recession, including the U.S. The U.S. might escape it. That's to me a 50-50 call. Of the G7, um, China and America are the two that might manage to sneak out of it. China, already there's talk, and this is now talk that's two weeks old, maybe coming in with a 4.5% GDP, which for China is a disaster. You know, they haven't been below 6% since the 60s. Um, but now there's mutterings that 45 might be optimistic. Now, of course, the flip of that is no one, there are a lot of people out there who say China fudge the numbers anyway, so China will make a number, and maybe they'll come in at 12% just to really freak everybody out. Who knows? Um, but Germany, but France, but the UK, but Italy, I mean, we're going to see recessions there. We're going to see markets lower. There is no way a high-valued market survives this. The question is, is it 10 or is it 25? And that is a wide enough range to drive man, the biggest tractor you ever did saw through it. I get that. But that's because that's markets for you. I mean, we're currently moving 4% a day, one direction or the other. When I say we, the market I'm talking about is the S&P 500. 
Dow Jones is a nonsense market and South Africa is an insignificant in terms of its size. This market can easily go back to that 22, 24, maybe even 2,000 level, 2,000 points, which is a lot from the top, but it's also a heck of a lot. I mean, there's your bottom down there of about 680 points in the worst of 2008. That bottom was March 2009, I think the 19th of March. And I know that because I got paid the next day and bought the market. And it was the smartest thing I did. And the amount of skill involved was zero. It was random luck. We got our bonuses on the 20th of March at Standard Bank. Um, I think that has implications for Trump. I don't see how he wins re-election in this space. And that's not a comment on whether it's his fault or whether he's a good or not president. But think of the one-term presidents out there. Uh, Daddy Bush, who had the recession. Uh, Carter, who had uh, the, the, his crisis was, was Iran, Iran-Contra. American voters, just like they're not going to give you another chance at all. The good news is by next year, the worst is behind us. In 12 months, markets will be lower, but in a year's time, this will be over. It will still be, and why will it be over? Well, because COVID-19 will no longer be killing people at the level it is now, because we will have a cure for it. We will have antibodies for it. We will be giving people injections and swabs and all of that sort of thing, and it will be okay. Now, of course, maybe COVID-20 comes along, but that's a different debate, and we park that for another day. COVID-19 won't be the problem, and by then, the supply chains are back up. They're happening again. And we've got that money we didn't spend while we were self-isolating, and we're spending our money. So it's going to be fairly short and sharp. And, and that's, you know, if you're going to have a crisis, make it quick. You know, that, that's the best type of crisis to have. So I think, you know, by this time next year, when I'm back in Durban in March of next year, we'll be reviewing the process and looking, you know, the opportunity for it. So let's quickly talk some opportunities, what to do. Or don't panic. Or as Douglas Adams would say, don't panic and carry a towel. I mean, you know what? Panic ain't ever served anybody. Don't panic. There's what you know. My grandfather always said, "Look, if you've got to panic, panic first. Like, if, if if there's a fire in the theater, make sure you're the first one out. Don't like like hang around." So, frankly, if you were going to panic, that that boat has sailed. Your opportunity was a month ago. It's now too late to panic. So, don't panic, but do carry a towel instead of a face mask. Don't sell everything. Don't sell everything for a bunch of reasons. First, maybe I'm wrong. More than that, you sell stuff. You're going to incur capital gains tax. You're going to take hits left, right, and center. And then you're left with the hardest thing of all, when to get back in. So there's a chap on Reddit, and it is the most soul-depressing thread I've ever seen. So he finally capitulated in February of 2009 and decided that this was nonsense and the world was ending and he turned his entire portfolio into cash. Approximately seven weeks before the market then went to the moon and the US market is up about 500% since then. He then decided in late 2018, September, that he had had enough and he got back into the market and it collapsed 20%. So he sold again. So he basically, over the last 12 years, has a negative return because cash earns you zero in America. Um, and and you know, getting out is one thing, which we're going to miss time anyway. Getting back in is the really, really hard part. You know, you want to get in at the bottom, but is this the bottom? And then it runs, and then it falls, and then it. And I know this because I've been there. I tried this. I tried this with the dot com crisis, and I just messed it up from every direction that was humanly possible. Man, I took small losses and turned them into monster losses. I was deeply, deeply skilled at that. So don't panic and sell everything. In short, carry on carrying on. If you buy ETFs every, every whatever your process is, I got a debit order that goes in the sixth of every month. That debit order continues. You know why? Well, because those things are getting cheaper. It's like when Woolies has a sale on chuckles. I go stock up on chuckles. My Woolies limits it to six per person. But I've got friends. We buy lots. Remember Glodiv? So I've spoken about Glodiv before. This is the ETF from Core Shares. So there's a couple of, of, of global ETFs. There's the Ashburton, which I like and own. There's the S&P 500. And there's the Satrix developed market. There's some nuances to them. The point of Glodiv is it's a global dividend aristocrat ETF. And in order to be included in that ETF as an American company, you need 25 years of dividend payment which means no Apple because they were bankrupt 25 years ago. It means no Google because they didn't exist 25 years ago. Ditto Facebook, ditto Amazon, et cetera, et cetera. Problem with, so Glodiv sells 
consumer staples. So your big stock is, I don't even know what those people do. Colgate Palmolive. My argument is always, there's a crisis. You're going to be brushing your teeth, right? Wash your hands. In fact, washing your hands. Colgate Palmolive. Brilliant. Except supply chain. I know what Unilever did a number of years ago is they looked around the world at their supply chains and they said, basically, if we're, make, we're making a product in like 30 different countries around the world, why don't we pick one southern hemisphere and one northern hemisphere country that makes it best and just make it there and then distribute to everybody else? Great idea until something like this happens and supply chains grind to a halt. And that's the difference in this crisis. There's nowhere to hide. There are some. I'll show you some in, in a moment. So certainly there's GloDiv. GloDiv is interesting. It, it, it's, it's out there if you're worried and scared. Um, have a look at your second tier riskier assets. I run a second tier portfolio. In there is Barlow World, Long for Life, Coronation. And there's a fourth one, and I can't remember what it is. And I have to make, and I'm going to make that call over this weekend, and I'll make it by Monday. Excuse me, what am I going to do with them? Short answer. At this point, standing here right now, if what I said is true, I can't think of a single reason to hold any of them. My death to us part portfolios, I will continue to hold. They will come under pressure. ShopRite will come under pressure. It shouldn't. It's cheap. Everything else. But you know what? I plan to die holding that share. Well, I sell it a week before and spend it on bubbles. But you get the point. My high quality stuff, I'm holding. That little sketchy stuff that you've got, that's where you've got to make those hard decisions. Um, if you need cash in the next three to five years, Broadly in the next three, not because the crisis is going to take three, but the recovery from where we started in, in, in February through to when we get back to that level could conceivably take a year and a half, maybe two. If you've got cash commitments in the next two to three years, you should anyway have had them sorted. They should not be in the stock market because that is too short term. If you've got cash commitments, someone's getting married or something in the next two to three years and you need a pile of money. You need to start asking, like, maybe it's time to make, you know, make sure you've got that pile of money. I remember in January of 2008, working at Standard Bank, lady phones. She's getting married in November. She's got 50K. She wants to put it in the market. So we've got 100,000. Put it in the market, grow it to 200,000 so she can have a grand wedding. And truthfully, in the preceding three years, our JSC was up 150%. This wasn't the craziest thing I'd ever heard. Except I said to her, but what happens if markets crash? You know, only one of you gets married. Now, I don't know what she did, but I was right. If she put it in the market, only one of them got married. And that wasn't because I saw the future. It was just because if you got short-term cash recruitments, which is anything under three years, have it in cash. Now, my sister's turning 50 in a year and change, two years' time, and uh, she wants to take everyone to the, to the Maldives, and she's been putting that money in a bank account. And she's like, it's boring. I'm like, I know, but you'll go to the Maldives. Otherwise, you might just go to Ushaka. And that won't, that won't be the same. Now, look, for Joburg boy, Ushaka is fun, but like, it won't quite be the same. Um, but then there's some clever places. Grinrod Prefs. So you all Durban peeps. We know Grinrod. The company uh, came out with results that were alarmingly solid. Man, they are producing money like there is no tomorrow. I think they're putting it up to sell it. I think Remgro, who has a big stake, is looking to sell Grinrod. Um, and a friend of mine who's way smarter than me said someone like Glencore or Anglo-American might buy them because, of course, they've got the commodity lines and they've got the big slug of Maputo, particularly for Glencore, who do a lot. And they used to have a JV, etc. But anyway, that is upside. The point is, is that I think Grinrod has the cash to pay the, 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 the preference shares to pay those dividends every two years. Today, the yield on those was 11.2%, of which there is, of course, dividend tax payable at 20%. The trick is, is that that is linked to primes. As prime falls, the yield will fall at the same time. However, you can be a little crafty with these things and, 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 and time your entry. There's some occasionally sellers pop up. I've seen that pref coming in. at If you buy at that price, you get an effective 13.5% yield. So don't rush in. If, you, if you're looking for somewhere you want to park some cash you don't need for the next couple of years, that is a great place to do it. Um, Metrofile. So delistings. Metrofile, and this number is now out of date. I checked the prices this afternoon and they had moved on me. There's an off on the table to my Metrofile for 3 rand 30 plus the dividend which will be announced next week. 
probably at least a five cent dividend, maybe 10, let's call it five. Effectively, by the end of June, you will get paid three rand and 35 cents for your Metro file shares. And you could, last week, have bought them at two rand 70. Today, you could have bought them at two rand 90. But that's a place where you can quickly make some cash. You get a return, even at 290, you're getting a return of around 18% if you analyze the numbers big. There are risks here because that deal might fall through. There are three big conditions. Raise the debt. That's not hard in this world. Uh, the second is competition commission approval. That's not a problem because they're being bought by an American REIT. And the third is a BEE partner, which apparently is the area they're struggling with. And the struggle is not that they can't find a BEE partner. The struggle is the queue goes out the door. Because this is a highly cash generative business, solid run operation, and their biggest shareholder is currently a mine workers union. So, yeah, and so, so we need to get a little bit creative there and, and find those. You know, normally, you know, you tell me buy a pref share and earn 11%. I'm like, yeah, come on. But if we're looking at like, you know, best case scenario, 10% lower, 11% is suddenly becomes proper. Um, so those are the conditions for Metrofile still coming through. If you are a trader, obey your stop losses, reduce your position side. If you are running 2% at risk, you now run 1% at risk. If that doesn't make sense to you, it's because you're not a trader, that's fine. And be careful of the short side because the short side is violent. So a friend of mine, Petri Radenhuis, who's a proper day trader, he takes a short position in the U.S. markets. And what promptly then happens, so Tuesday evening, he is short. Powell cuts the rates by 50%, the market gaps a percent, he gets stopped out, the market goes down and closes minus four, and he made no money. In fact, he lost money. He was right, but he lost money because the shorts are violent. I know my trading's completely changed, but in the olden days when I traded more aggressively, I didn't go short. I didn't trade shorts. When things were when there were short signals, I just moved to cash. Because I own interest. Short side is violent because of that volatility. The volatility becomes insane. Um, medical supplies, they've moved already. Bitcoin, no. Shorts, no. I mean, so the, the, the cruise lines are telling you 40% cut in, in, in sales for 21 and 22. Yes. But you know what? In October, when the virus is gone, your newspaper is going to be full of discount tours on boats. And you know what we're going to all have? Cash because we haven't been spending it for three months because we've been scared to go out. Most of the clever ideas are gone. There's opportunities, Tencent. So you're in Wuhan and you haven't been out for six weeks. What are you doing? Well, you're playing games on Tencent, you epic games, et cetera. And that's just, you know, the one that, you know, Tencent because obviously NASPAS. And ironically, it might hold us up a bit. Payment systems, which again is Tencent, online cash transfers, et cetera. But not delivery companies. Because are you going to order Uber Eats? Well, are you going to have a driver? Do you trust your driver? Do you trust the restaurant? You can't be self-quarantined and you order food from a random restaurant. We have no idea what their hygiene principles are. And is the driver going to come to your door? I mean, I don't know. I mean, look, you're welcome to find out. Let me know. I'm on Twitter. But um, so, so, you know, so the problem with delivery is, is the driver, you know, Amazon, yes. So you can get everything through Amazon, but are they going to have delivery staff? I don't know. So it's going to be tough. Uh, the worst will be behind us by the end of the year. That I'm fairly sure of. Uh, and you know, understand that this is a view, and I've been wrong before. But to me, there's just too many points here that, that squeeze our global economy. And the only way out of this, and it's a really, really simple one, is that if that big number of, 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 of confirmed cases currently at 96,000 just stops rising. If that number just stops going up, we maybe have a hope. But even if it stops going up, there's trouble in the system already. There's construction, constriction happening in that system already. And of course, for South Africa, you know, and I haven't talked on a local issue much, um, you know, hello recession, color nobody surprised. It was a brilliant budget from Mbaweni. The hard part is clawing back 160 billion from the unions. Um, and the irony there, and I've said it before, of course, Mbueni was our first labor minister, and Ramaphosa formed the unions in the 80s and West Street and the like, and now they're going to have to break them. The biggest problem, that $160 billion is not pay cut. It's simply saying to union members is your increase will be inflation as opposed to inflation plus. And if you can just give them inflation instead of inflation plus, that saves $160 billion. Problem. He wants to do it this year, and two years ago they signed a three-year wage negotiation. They need the unions to break the wage negotiation. Now, this is going to come down to a big steering competition between 
uh, uh, Imbueni Ramaphosa on the one side and the unions on the other. The unions find themselves in a deeply interesting place. Let's take Kusatu, which is where the public sector wage union sits. Firstly, last year, President signed the Secret Strike Ballot Act into, into, uh, uh, into law. In the olden days, if you were going to go on a no work, no pay strike, it was an open vote. Everybody raise your hand. Didn't matter what I think, I raised with the majority. Now that vote is secret. So suddenly we're saying, I'm asking you to secretly vote to not get fed or earn an income for six months. It's one thing to be a rebel riser. It's another thing to really hit your pocket. It has been untested, but it's going to change the dynamic. But unions in this country are weakened. There are, the membership is at the lowest level in 20 years, in part because our economy has been shrinking, particularly mining, but also in part because the youth aren't going into the unions. <coughs> also, the unions are a mess because SATU is essentially split. We haven't had – the last big union action was 2015, and that was – was it 2015? Which was the e -tolls. And that was an easy one, right? That was almost that was more of an anti-Zoomer rather than anything else, and that was – everyone coalesced around it. The other big strikes were Armcoop platinum sector. Kusatu's last big strike action was 2012. Can anyone here name a senior leader of Kusatu? In the olden days, it was easy. Bavi. Bavi got kicked out. Unions are weak. So I think they can do it. The hard one's going to be ESCOM. Different, you know what? ESCOM just turns the lights off and then we're, well, we're back where we were, right? I mean, that, that's as it was. But uh, so, so, um, our rand will weaken, our market will go down. I mean, our rand today 15.50 because of somebody's got COVID-19 in Durban. Um, it's going to it's going to get messy. We're not going to be immune from this. I think the best news is that when I come back in March of next year, it'll be behind us. This, you know, whereas when the crisis of 08, 09 was happening, it was two years before we thought it was behind us because we didn't know. Here we've got a definite the cause. That's our cause. COVID-19. We squish that then maybe we're in some biz.